It's a Daily Talk Show, episode 453. What's going on, guys? How are we? Yeah, very good. Uh, Sarah Holloway, uh, lawyer turned fun entrepreneur. <laughs> I feel like I've got it stuck in, in my head. Uh, when did you come up with fun entrepreneur? Oh, I think it was probably right at the beginning when mm. I had first gone full time, but I still felt like a total fraud. And I can't really say mm. that that's disappeared as much as I would hope that it would have by now. <laughs> is it fair to say that, that the funness comes, it's the opposite of being a lawyer? Is a lawyer being, is it fun to be a lawyer? I mean, I think it is for some people. Yeah. And I think they're the vast minority of people mm. who do law and start their careers <laughs> as lawyers. There's definitely an element of fun for the super brainiac side of your brain. Is it anything like um, suits? Oh, I mean, <laughs> less than I thought. Yeah. I was getting really pumped, you know, to think that I was going to this glamorous career with like beautiful clothes and, you know, you start with this like last for about a week. Yeah. And I, I reckon when a deal closes and there's champagne, like that's really glamorous and exciting, but most of it's paper pushing, eating, you know, Maccas at your desk. and Oh, God. I yeah. mean, some people that's the life. Yeah, you yeah. Live, live, live in the dream. <laughs> I mean, if you love it, if you love it, it's great. And yeah. like some people, there's a lot of adrenaline. So yeah. some people really love that. Well, you've, you've almost gone to the opposite side, which is, and we've had a lot of people in the show. So we've had someone who has a criminology degree, mm -hmm. hasn't used it. Mr. 97, he's smart as hell. And um, now look where you are, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Just helping a couple of gronks. But was it always, for you, were you wanting to, like, I mean, to, we grew up together, you know, going to school. It's like do the uni thing. It's like, mm. you know, be studious, abide by the rules, do the degree. When did you start getting a hint of, oh, i got to get out of this? Oh, I think it was pretty early that I knew. So... Pretty much since I was a kid, I've had equal parts nerd burger and arty farty is how I describe it. And, you know, when you're a kid, you kind of keep doing, you keep your options open, you keep mm. all doors open. At school, I did all different subjects and all different extracurricular activities. Then at uni, I did arts law. So I still kind of kept both sides alive. So it wasn't until I got into full-time work and I was a couple of years in that I realized one part had slowly started to just die away. Like there's no role for that fun arty fighty side mm. in a strictly corporate environment. And I don't think I'd gotten to the point where I hated it. It's more in hindsight that I'm like, whoa, I was really stifling a lot of my mm. creativity. At the time it was more a feeling of I'm probably not going to end up here forever. It doesn't light me up, but it's not awful. You know, it's so hard to get a job as a lawyer. So when you do get it, the first year you just spend being grateful that you've yeah. got a job at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, you're getting paid well, like you've gone from a uni wage to all these opportunities. I got to work in Hong Kong for six months. Mm. There's enough for, you know, the A-type excited personality when the learning curve is really steep. It's still exciting for a while. Mm. It's more that I realised when I did start Matcha, it was the comparison that kind of woke me up to like, oh, wait, this is how I feel when I do the legal work, mm. but this is like me. I like feel like my true self and all the stuff that I'd been letting kind of disappear came back again. Mm. And it was only by that contrast that I was like, oh, this is maybe not where I'm meant to end up. Mm. Mm. I think a lot of people get in there and they're like, I need to get out. I wasn't like that. Yeah. So you've got a podcast now, Seize the Yay, which is where I feel, when I feel like I think of you now, that's a lot of the stuff where um, I see you spending your time there's before the or after the lawyering and before the podcast, you started um, Matcha Milk Bar, is that right? Yeah, and, and Matcha Maiden. And Matcha Maiden. What was the uh, the catalyst for making that switch from the Matcha side of things, but then also saying making the next pivot across to podcasting? Oh, good question. I think pretty similar to both of those businesses. Mm -hmm. They were random ideas that came out of nowhere that, just is kind of how CZA came about is that I didn't even realise at the time when I was doing law that I wasn't happy. I just was fine, you know, and I think a lot of people are just fine and they're like, oh, this is just how mm. life is. And until you see something that's more than fine, you don't even notice. Mm. So the idea of the podcast came out because I realised how many other people are in that situation and I was lucky enough to have, you know, an illness and then a discovery of match, a totally by accident that allowed me to start on this pathway that ended up in a complete life change. But a lot of people don't have something that just wakes them up one day. So the whole idea of, you know, seize the A being my life philosophy of don't just be on this conveyor belt of productivity, uh, start to find the joy in things again and let your inner child stay alive and stop being so serious about everything all the time. That idea came about because I realised I had found my joy, left corporate, started these businesses, but then three or four years in had started to corporatize 
those. Mm. And it's this cycle that you get into of like you find the joy again, you take a big jump, and then the comfort zone catches up with you and then you just sit there. And I was like, oh, I left law to get away from this and then I'm my own boss and I've created the same situation where I'm burning out, I don't have the joy, I'm not excited, I'm the learning curve has slowed down. And I just realised everyone has to have something at all times, whether it's your full-time job or whether it's your side hustle, that makes you excited. Mm. And that makes you excited about everything mm. because you've got something that is driving you each day. So I was like, I need to start something new. It's been five years. Nick and I have been together 10 years now, but we, you know, became business partners and suddenly had no like boundaries between couple and, you know, our like pillow talk would be our bass. <laughs> and I was like, wow, <laughs> something has to be done about this. Like I need something on the side. And the podcast came about again because I was just always seeking to learn and grow and follow the joy and the, the bits that spark you. And I, I think the bigger a food or like or any kind of retail business gets, the further away you get from the customer mm. And so in the beginning, we were like right in that personal connection. But as it got bigger and bigger, I realized as we scale, I don't get to speak to the customer. I don't get the people bit. And that's my bit. That's the bit I mm. love. Is it more painful finding out that second time around where you have actively tried to seek a lifestyle that works for you? <laughs> more painful that it didn't happen? Or? Well, yeah, I guess that once you get, because I guess I've had a bunch of transitions or pivots in my life and... Uh, when you pivot to the next thing, which is going to be the thing, it's meant to be the thing that's going to tick all the boxes. Yeah. When it doesn't, it can be a bit rattling because you realise, oh, hang on, maybe this is me. <laughs> maybe this mm. wasn't the lawyer job at all. Yeah, totally. I think in the bit between realising that I'd hit my kind of comfort zone, not my comfort zone, but I'd hit that kind of grind again mm -hmm. and before I had the idea for the podcast, which I reckon was a couple of months, I was totally lost. I was like, what, a, what What? do I do now? Like I've kind of made this big jump but you can't keep spinning that story for, you know, it's been years now. It's mm -hmm. like I've got it. What, what else is – what else am I leave? What, what else is my legacy? And what are the bits that unite the bits that I love with the bits that I'm really good at? And I felt that in the matcha business and even in the hospitality business, they were starting to be the bits that I wasn't that good at and mm -hmm. then also the bits that I wasn't that lit up by. But I think that's what – that discomfort is what kind of makes you search for something new, which it's no mistake that then a couple of months later something else came up. And that's another thing that really helped me through that whole period was realising that once you make one big jump in your life, it's not like you just take a step back and go, oh, cool, I'm done now. Like mm -hmm. made one big jump, I'm, I'm good. Like I am over self-congratulatory, so I was like <laughs> patting myself on the back for years and years. <laughs> but I think you – especially in this day and age, and this is what I talk about on, on the podcast, there's meant to be so many chapters. So maybe Matcha Maiden came to get me out of the legal career, but it was only one step. And maybe there's five more steps before I find my actual thing. And instead of holding on to that, like, I've done this, I have to make this work, I just, you know, I think I started the podcast and realised, oh, it could have just been leading me to this mm. or this could be still leading me to something else. Like it's all an unfolding, evolving mm. process. Well, everything we do, it, we don't know the result well, I mean, you know, we can't see the future. Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, that's what I love about creative endeavours outside of business, right, the mm -hmm. stuff that doesn't really make sense. It's the bug flying in my face. doesn't really make sense. <laughs> I'm being very artsy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm, like, I'm an arty guy. <laughs> You're doing the NLP. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, we, we had an artist on this week who um, was putting up posters. He's now written a book. He's got, a, you know, fame worldwide for what he's done. Mm -hmm. But I don't. he didn't have that when he's rolling it up, that that's going to be the thing. Mm. And so when you start something like a, a podcast, what was your – going into your podcast, we love talking about podcasts on this podcast, let's be honest. <laughs> we don't get that many. I mean, in the early podcast. days, yeah, like the first <laughs> the first 50 episodes, there was a lot of podcast chat. So it's like, what yeah. do we want this podcast to be? <laughs> but I guess <laughs> – So do, we, do you think we'll do the podcast in 100 episodes? I don't know. I guess yeah, we'll yeah, find yeah. out. We're 450 <laughs> something in yeah, and, we're, yeah, we're still doing. Yeah. But for you – when you take on a creative project, how far down the track are you thinking? You said you're an A-type. You know, you, you <laughs> use that term. I've heard that more this week than I've ever heard in my life. Mm. I'll say now I say yay type. Okay. Yay type. You're a yay type. Mm. Have you done any trademarks, by the way? Yeah, I have. I could imagine that. It's my legal stuff. I've got yay type. I've got um, work rest yay. Um, <laughs> right. I've started using yayborhood, like welcome to the yayborhood. <laughs> <laughs> have you actually, because one of the things with trademarks is obviously you need to defend them. Have you had to, any moments where you've had to um, send any letters or anything yet? Up or no? until last week, no. In oh, really? the whole, so I actually trademarked CZA mm -hmm. 18 months before I started the podcast because I had the idea and I knew I would use it for something. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, this is great. Like it just 
captures everything that I think about life that you don't seizing the day is too productivity, achievement, mm. success, money, milestones. I want it to be much more about like joy and, and fulfillment and excitement. But then anyway, I had no idea what I'd use it for. And in that whole time, I hadn't had anyone try and use it until a billboard came out and I've got a little Seize the A like Facebook community group, mm-hmm. the neighborhood, obviously, yeah. <laughs> and um, which I started like maybe a month ago and someone saw the billboard and was like, you're doing a collaboration with this massive company. It's all up all over Melbourne Central. This is amazing. And I was like, oh, no, I'm not actually. Um, but not tell sure. me the details, yeah. where it is. Yeah. So what do you do? I mean, I mean this is exciting. I mean, it's been removed now. So. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I mean, is that your doing? It was my doing, yeah. Oh, I guess you get to defend. Well, because that's the intel- – I mean, that's I want to get back to my question. Yeah, though. but that's what intel- – yeah. I'm, I'm excited by Bullet that. Point. <laughs> uh, intellectual property, I mean, that's what you're holding on to, right? Like yeah. if you've got these ideas and brand, then you, you need well, to protect them. to that though, I think, yeah, people, creatives are like, oh, it's just an idea. Like most, most creatives don't have a law degree. Let's yeah. be honest. Yeah. People who start a podcast and they have a good idea. Mm-hmm. And so, we, I mean, we looked into the trademarking thing. Yeah. We did have the whole. Done it? Yeah. So we We're tried. We're not smart enough we'll be, to. We'll oh, be, get I'll help. help. <laughs> well, because of the. <laughs> no, well, we did the pre uh, the pre check where they get someone from oh, yeah. IP Australia to look at it. And they were saying it's like too generic, like the the daily talk show. We can't uh, oh, we can't trademark because it's yeah too broad. Yeah, too broad, broad. But then uh, Justine Flynn from Thank You was saying that what they did was, uh, I think they trademarked the image for they started yeah. the image level. But I don't know. We I do that with Match of Maiden, so you can do a word mark, which is just the words, or you can do the logo mm-hmm. with which captures the words and then that gives you some protection because mm-hmm. then even if they use a different logo, you can say it still resembles the picture because uh, the letter, like the whole thing overall looks very mm-hmm. similar. And so what's the, the – so, TJ, what was your question? I'm um, worried about – you were so certain on it. You didn't remember <laughs> yeah, no, what the fuck then it was. Then start <laughs> trademark law. No, it was about cre- crea- creative endeavours, stuff that doesn't really make sense financially, especially that you actually enter into – and then forming a plan around that, right? Because you could come up, oh, mm-hmm. start a podcast and, you know, all f- here's month one, month two, this is how I'm going to monetize. Yeah. How far ahead do you think in your creative endeavours? Um, not very far at all. Mm. I with I always say I've gone from having like a five-year plan or a 50-year plan to not even a five-minute plan, which I kind of like. Mm. I'm like obviously at lots of different extremes. I'm either like super anally retentive planning mm. or I'm like, fuck it, let's do it right now. Um, and I think – since moving into business and this was another realization that happened when I decided to start the podcast was that you if you give yourself too much time to think it over and I'm a big overthinker like if I don't rip the band-aid I probably won't do it Mm. and managing the self-doubt has been the biggest biggest challenge I think along the way because in law you know I've studied for seven years to do it you've got a really clear hierarchy of who to ask questions to you're never out of your depth that and you always know what's coming next even if you're learning about different content or like learning different levels of responsibility. It's still like a familiar environment, Mm. but moving into business where you have no qualifications, the whole business environment is different. Even if you had mentors that were clear, I think it's been good for me to get out of that whole, I need to know what's happening in five months, 10 months time. It's like, you don't even know if Instagram will exist in five months or Mm. 10 months time. You don't know what e-commerce platforms are coming out. So why agonize over all the tiny details when it's going to change month to month anyway? So is it about being ready Agile. Agile. I think like the ability to adapt constantly to a new environment is more important than having it planned out in advance. You obviously have to like have an idea of how you're going to pay your bills and, you know, who you're going to ask and how you get your equipment. But I think one of the big things in the whole CZA philosophy is I always say um, doubt kills more dreams than failure ever will and done is better than perfect. And I've gone from being like such a perfectionist who is trained to be risk averse and to find all the things that are going to go wrong and, and, need to combat every single possibility to someone who's like, don't even worry about it. Half of those won't eventuate anyway. Mm. And then even if you get it perfect and you think that's perfect, you'll release it into the market and they'll they'll hate it and you'll need to change everything anyway. Mm. So just mm. put it out there, get your minimum viable product, whatever it is, podcast episode one. That's all I had thought about was like, how do I get one out there? Mm. And Matcha Maiden was the same. Like how do we sell one bag to one stranger and then I can put on my LinkedIn that I'm an entrepreneur and then I can go back to law and it'll be all happy and joy, joy and like I can tick off that box, you yeah. know. Or the side hustle is almost the the hiding place because you, yeah. you can call it a side hustle because mm. most people who have a side hustle would love if you gave them a magic wand to make that full-time. their full-time thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But I think it's good to just start. 
because mm. the biggest lessons you'll ever learn are only once you've started and once you get your idea out there and then start to mould it. Mm. Whereas people paralyze themselves with like overthinking and then the fears and the you know risk and all that stuff, it really bogs you down. So I kind mm. of just, I think I had the idea for the podcast in like October and I asked my first guest so that that would force me to buy the equipment for the date that I had set with her. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> and then I just figured out how to record on the day and yeah. then I was like, shit, i got to edit it now. Like yeah, how am I going to do yeah. that? <laughs> like, Nothing like a bit of pressure from <laughs> yeah. external forces. How do you deal with like uh, family and friends uh, if you're in a situation where they're like, oh, what are you up to doing this podcast? Uh, we get a, a lot around monetization. How are you making money from this yeah. thing? Mm. How do you, have you got a good answer that we could use? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's actually been amazing having such support firstly nick being my mm. partner and him he's never had a job he's literally been an entrepreneur yeah. for every stage of his career so that's made it a lot less foreign to the people around us it meant mm. our networks kind of used to and a lot of people are in business already yeah. so i was kind of the late comer mm -hmm. so it wasn't this whole like like my law friends obviously were quite shocked and my corporate friends were like what are you how are you getting up at 11 in the morning going to yoga i don't understand and traveling all the time and I'm you work surprised. on your laptop you actually, you actually sleep till 11 that's a bloody effort <laughs> i mean sometimes yeah. that's a huge effort <laughs> no, not every on day the, but... on the 5 30 a.m you know <laughs> club that's being pushed and oh, I, I appreciate that the 11 11 a. Club. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great club it's a great i'm solely the sole member but that's okay um yeah yeah, yeah, yeah clock yeah it's, it's, it's yeah, yeah, that is exactly what it's called <laughs> Uh, yeah. And so do, have you had to, like, is there anyone where you do feel that pressure? Um, because I guess there is a difference between freelance and business and say with what we're doing, mm. no clear business model yet. There's obviously uh, advertising at a certain scale. Uh, but if you're thinking only five minutes ahead yep. nowadays, <laughs> is, there, is there a good way of communicating it to, to people? Yeah, I think... Um I, I think in both situations it, I've made the circumstances in a way that the news is a lot easier to break. So by mm -hmm. the time I wanted to leave my job, the business was already doing well enough. Like we, I kept my job for the first six to eight months. So I'd go to work, work like a 20 hour day, come home, pack matter in the middle of the night, go back to work. And so by the six months, you know, in, I was like, I'm going to leave my job, but we're already making money. So, yeah. you know, it's proof mm -hmm. of concept. I'm, mm -hmm. It's not a stupid, irresponsible decision. And then by the time the podcast started, it started as a hobby. Mm -hmm. It was never meant to make money so that that took the pressure off because we were already, we already had jobs yeah, sure. and, and businesses. It was a lot easier to say, if it monetizes, amazing. So it's worth spending all the time on it. If it doesn't, like I'm, you know, doing something that clearly has proven itself by now. Um, and then I think if you can talk down things that you're doing at the beginning to make it sound less mm -hmm. of a huge jump, then it helps yeah. you be able to cope with it and then everyone around you to get on board more. But I also am in that unique, amazing situation where I'm Asian but I don't have Asian parents because <laughs> I was adopted. Yeah. I think you know yeah, that already. Yeah. So my parents are completely white, country bumpkin Australians. So everyone's always like, how did you tell your parents? And I'm like, I don't have target parents. My parents are Aussies. So I'm like, you go, you live your dreams. Yeah, yeah. Like you do, you know, they've been so encouraging that there's been no family pressure. Yeah. Um, and Has then, there been a transition though through the podcast as it's built momentum to say, oh, okay, now I actually need to be thinking this with a different lens rather than it being a hobby? Yeah, I think once you get to the stage where you have enough of an audience uh, who are taking on what you say in such a serious nature and applying it to their life, you realise you have a level of responsibility that you probably didn't think that you would have. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to think, oh, I probably have to be a bit more conscious of not being so random. And like, I, I, I love the chats being so open and so random, but always to make sure that I've done my research. If there's anything super controversial to make sure that I've covered off you know, how I'm going to cope with that, mm -hmm. that if it goes super open. like What would be of, an example of controversy? Um, not so much controversy, but more like, um, you know, if I'd, Osher Ginsburg came on and was talking really openly about suicide and mm -hmm. I was like, I need to make sure I recover that in a responsible way because it's not to five people anymore. It's, yeah. you know, to a lot of people or thing, you know, things like that that are hard to cover in a way that if anyone sensitive is listening that mm. you're doing your audience justice and doing it, you know, in a way that, yeah, I think as it's got bigger and then as sponsors have started to come on board, it also has started to mean 
more serious decisions about, well, if I took that sponsor on, what would that mean for my content? And I don't want any anything to influence my ability to cover things that I think are really important. Mm. Um, yeah. You have a lot of spread, uh, being type A, a lot of spreadsheets. So what are you looking at from a <laughs> measurable perspective? Like what are you measuring uh, in regards to CCA? Um, I look at the, the, like the listens mm. that each episode gets. I still, I think because part of the reason for starting it for me was to inject something that's for joy that isn't metric based. Mm -hmm. I really have to hold myself back from trying to get growth episode on episode or week on week. Like I know the shameless girls are, have been so clever in the way they've strategized how they want, you know, the growth to double and triple and how they do that. But I've focused more on just getting the content out that I really want to get. And then everything else is like a side effect because I, my na my like nature mm. is to go, oh, but I got, you know, 20,000 last week. So I want yeah. blah, blah, blah this week. And then, mm. you know, in the week three, I got this. So by week 30, I should be, you know, I've tried to not make it about that. Like yeah. I have happened to have an episode every week, but I've never announced that it's weekly. It's just like, if I can do it, amazing. If I can't, if I miss one week, like there's You'd no pretty date upset that though it, now. Now I probably would, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So is this yeah. the announcement that it's now once a week? Yeah, yeah it's a weekly. That's a good exclusive. Exclusive, exclusive yeah. it's a weekly. Exclusive content. Yeah. Well, someone actually said to me, they're like, every Wednesday I'm waiting. And I'm like, what? Wednesday? Yeah. What? And it just turned out that they'd been coming every Wednesday for like seven weeks. And I was like, oh, oh wow. That's funny. There, there's yeah. patterns though. Um, we had Shanna Kennedy on who. Oh, from Calm, from the Calm. Bo Author? Uh, yeah. yeah, she's got uh, the Shine. life, the life plan. The life plan, yeah. yeah. Got it over there. But um, she, Mitchell Mitchell. She's mm. awesome. She was um, talking about something she works with, you know, a lot of corporates, executives, that it's just about standing in front of the mirror. I don't know if she actually gets them physically to stand there, but it's about <laughs> looking at yourself and taking away the job title. Mm. So be taking away the podcast, the things that you do, mm. which the thing is it sounds like you've morphed these things that you love to do into your business, which – kind of becomes you, right? Mm. And so I look at what we do and it could be different if you are a lawyer working 75 hours, 80 hours, it could be more in a law firm a week where you take away that because you actually have stuff outside of it. Mm. What is it for you? What, what, Or do you see these things completely intertwined into who you are as a person? You mean like stripping back all the stuff that yeah. I do? Yeah, the, the brand, the podcast, yeah. the things you do daily, which yeah. it seems like you love. So that's where I'm sort of yeah. wondering, are they so intertwined? I think yes, but part of the podcast for me, so I, I'm so excited that the podcast has ended up being something that people really enjoy joy mm. and seem to be getting something out of, but it very much started as I'm doing this because I need to fix something in myself, which was not having hobbies and not having things that had no metrics. So is this so, a, so the podcast was a, a hobby it at was, its core? Yeah, it was mm. a very like you don't announce when you're you're doing uh -huh. it. You don't try and get sponsors if they come amazing. You don't mm. have a schedule. There's no like the metrics, you know, you look at them, but there's no like try and hit this by this time. Mm. Um, it's I've tried to let it be the opposite of what everything else is because mm. the, the businesses have to be because of the logistics and stuff, they have to be the opposite. So it's been my release from planning and and achieving and like being productive even though I've kind of turned it into that now but the one of the sections of each episode is play TA which is who the person is when they're not doing like you're a human being not a mm. human doing so when you aren't your job or your hobbies or your output what are you and I think for me I do everything I love but I try to still have at least like all of Sunday, I don't do podcast or work. Mm. That's just my day that I need to, like I get quite bad anxiety and that's one full day where I just like put my phone away, it's on airplane mode. I might like take it to take photos of the dog or something. Um, but that's when I like read crime books or spy books or garden or do puzzles or go for a run. Or How do you find switching off? Josh was mentioning this. Yeah, it's that I mean, six days of, you know, going mm, hard and then one day where mm, but I find off. Sundays are like my most anxious days. Like the day of ah. switching switching off for me, I'm like, I'm not going to do anything. So then I eat shit food. Like I think if I ate better food and did walking, it would be better. It's just when I'm like... <laughs> 
You I know what? Slough. I'm just gonna yeah, I'm just gonna watch YouTube and I just go down some really dumb rabbit hole. They're the Mate, best rabbit holes. I know though. they are good, and that's what I always am seeking to do. It's like, I'm, but then by the end of the day, it's normally because Brie does stuff like she's like, well, I'm gonna like go out, and then mm. she comes home, and then I'm, I'm sort of there. a bit of a sook. <laughs> I'm like, well, where have you been? You know? like, <laughs> yeah. I thought we we're having today together. <laughs> exactly, a little <laughs> bit of that. Yeah. Yeah. a little bit of that. So I mean, what is so is the Sunday. Is that that decompression, uh, is that alleviating anxiety or is that giving you an opportunity to actually sit and address the anxiety? I think it started as my most anxious day Mm -hmm. because I was just like, "Mm." and then I think it's like anything, if the more you practice something and the more your body learns to expect that on a Sunday you're not going to have to use your brain, it just takes the pressure off every other day of the week because it's Mm -hmm. like I'm operating at such intensity and your brain's going, and like Mm -hmm. even when you're just so people facing and pouring energy into relationships and like being at the cafe and you're like all the time. I know that I can hold that up because on Sunday I don't have to speak. Yeah. And I think once I got past that initial kind of three or four weeks of it feeling yuck, I feel like that's what happens. That's the nature of this like, you know, overstimulated anxious society that we're in is that rest actually feels yuck at the Mm, start because you're searching for something to do because you've been taught that your like default nature is stimulation. Or even like going to bed early. Yeah. Like I went to bed at nine. What the fuck am I doing? (laughs) I went to bed at nine last night. I thought I was like winning. I actually didn't go to sleep until 10.30. What were you I was doing? like, on my phone. Oh, on your phone. Yeah, but the phone is just a... I need to get rid of it. just phone. zaps your... Yeah. It almost yeah. like when, when you were more brain dead from a big week and being on your phone, then it's just like you're fully in a vortex. But it's almost Total something vortex. enjoyable yeah. about like the... The brainlessness? The scro- yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah. then I appreciate that what I love about your brand and what you do on Instagram is you're one of the few people who it's like you do have a level of positivity. Like it doesn't seem like... It seems like you're enjoying the content that you're creating, oh, and it's thank like you. I think it's it's also because the way that you speak to the camera. I think Emmy Lou is another person who does it uh, really well. But it's just the um, yeah. I think what I learned from watching you is that you can be in the, the platforms and still be a functioning adult because <laughs> it feels like <laughs> it feels like at times the amount of time I could be like, oh man, I've spent six hours on Instagram today. Yeah. Which is quite high. She's, I and guess. quite regular. Yeah. Yeah. But is that what you're doing? I mean, are <laughs> yeah, you spending yeah. that amount of time? But I think it's also since having since being a bit more clear about what I'm using it for, I think it takes a really long time to get comfortable with why you're there mm-hmm. and what you're trying to do with it. And since the podcast, it's been so clear to me that it's to spread joy. Like yeah. one of my favorite quotes is people will never remember what you said or what you did. They'll always remember how you made them feel. And I feel like that's my brand is every conversation, every time they buy matcha, every time they listen to the podcast that they leave being like, yay, life. And it feels like a bit detached as well. Like I think like Tommy and I were talking about it, having a show, having something, uh, gives us this license to put stuff out more because mm. it doesn't necessarily feel like, like it's, it doesn't yeah. feel like it's us either. Like in some ways, like it feels like say at the beginning we would never post like Tommy especially not much stuff on personal Instagram and then you just get to a point of like, oh, this is the sh- – when you're doing a podcast and talking for an hour mm. a day, oh, this is who we are. Like, yeah. This is all well, we've you're got. you're convincing yeah. yourself also. And I think it's of the thing that you do. So yeah. there's a confidence level in what you do when yeah. you start doing it for long enough mm-hmm. because there's a lot of noise of people who just you see them, they've celebrated mm-hmm. and put a launch party out for episode one yeah. and then it just kind of fizzles out. That was actually <laughs> the best episode and yeah. the most fun that they ever had in the project. Yeah. Were you worried about that, uh, getting the podcast out there? Was there, was there a mechanism so that you could get past that? I think it's... Uh, 11, da- the 11 episodes, there's a mm. sweet number. The that, critical, yeah, the critical point, point of like death. Yeah. 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 Well, Josh speaking, death my, Valley. <laughs> yeah, yeah. my old podcast, Josh speaking did 11 episodes. Yeah. So I feel like that's the no, I've read potential that. Is number. It, yeah. is it, oh, wow. Um, I didn't even see. This is why I think it's good sometimes not to do your research and mm. just start because otherwise around episode 11, mm. I would have been like, ah. Oh, that's yeah. so true. But I was just like, no, nah, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And so you were doing one, of, was the, did you batch any at the start or was it? I've like, been all over the place. So mm. I batched the first I did one then I batched five because I was in Sydney and they were all in Sydney and then I went to two weeks ahead kind of rolling 
And then I went through a phase where I was literally like three days before or mm-hmm. two days before I was like, fuck, I've got nothing. Yeah. And then now I'm like nine weeks ahead. Oh, wow. Or maybe yeah. 10. Does because- it change the type of content? Because I guess one of the things that we've discovered with doing the daily talk, talk show is having the always on sort of we're continually moving it's all chronological, so it's all mm. quite easy. And when we have, we had a couple of moments where we've done batching and it can, it changes the dynamic a little bit. Yeah. Have you thought about that in regards to, oh, this is going out in nine weeks. Where is my guest going to be yep. in regards to the, the audience? Yeah, I th- Definitely prefer not to go further than maybe three or four weeks because mm-hmm. I think when you're chatting in a really informal, like casual context, you always talk about stuff that's happening in the news yeah. or like mm. topical current stuff or there's a launch coming up and then by the time it comes out they've already launched it mm. and it just feels a bit stilted. It's just because we're getting married that yeah. I was like, oh, I want to ha- make sure that there's, you know, something Kind it's of sensible. lined up. It makes, yeah, it makes a lot of good excuses. But, uh, it makes a lot of sense. I've definitely felt, and because we're, you know, traveling a lot in the next couple of weeks, but I've definitely felt that now when I'm editing them, I'm like, oh, wow, that was a long time. What did yeah. I even say? And So editing, do you, we don't edit at all. Because really? We could, yeah, yeah, we could. Sorry, we should have let you know before. <laughs> oh, no, no, did you, uh, the, oh, you mean as in, well, not as you in, don't. No, but as no, in you just, no, 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 we don't edit at all. Wow. Like, uh, we never cut no, everything out. No. You never have? No. no. Which is, uh once early that so we it brings in a new element when you're starting to film stuff yes mm-hmm. so there was a few, like once earlier on which is this is the you you learn really quickly when you have to do that because then you're like never again yeah. and so yeah it's good practice just so that we can get through them and yeah, yeah so i yeah. think i mean are you, <laughs> it's like a time constraint thing more exactly, than yeah, exactly. more than an editorial decision yeah, yeah. But it's also like the i think you become maybe a better performer maybe not a performer but mm. like a better communicator in regards to you don't have the option to mm. edit well if, if you were to do talks which i know you do if you could know that you could cut every one of them up it just then becomes this perfect thing where yeah it's an evolution you grow from seeing your thing out in the world that it isn't what you wanted it to be so mm. then you've got another option to come mm. another opportunity to come back and try but there's a, it's strategic too i think for you it makes sense to edit based on giving people a very bespoke experience around mm. CZA, mm. whereas I think what we're trying to emulate is a couple of gronks talking. Like ch- I love and the so, word gronk. Where yeah, did you what, get that from? Well, that's my favourite word yeah. and then I just started using it and then I didn't realise how much I used it and then we had people emailing us saying I've been using gronk. Yeah. Word. <laughs> so our audience is called the gronk squad. Yeah. Is this an original um, jacket creation? Yeah. Like is, no, well, it it's, it's, it was on or? Urban Dictionary. But <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> And then um, there's a guy, an uh, NFL player, Gronkowski, mm. who uses wow. Gronk. Wow, okay. And um, so I think we actually got a GIF into Instagram through his. We, we've got the Gronk <laughs> squad, so we got this flashing Gronk squad. <laughs> but I think they only let it in because of they him. They thought it was yeah, him. They thought yeah, it was yeah, him. No. Which Have was, you tried to do the whole GIFy thing? Yeah, yeah. We it's did have a match made The pains that we go through. <laughs> it's actually, yeah, tough. It's tough. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of the stuff you do and the stuff we do, I think it's quite natural in the early days to look to your right or left and see someone doing something that kind of is what you want to be they, doing they or where you want to be. They have a verified They have a giphy. Let's be honest. We looked at Matcha Maiden. <laughs> We're pissed. <laughs> no, but I think it's it's quite natural to have the knee-jerk reaction, the visceral response of, oh, like, you know, it's almost not jealousy but it's, it's a reflection of you and where you are, mm. I think, as a person. Um, have you had those moments where you are looking left and right at maybe competitors or people mm. doing a similar thing. Yeah, definitely. I think early on especially when we literally went from being the first to market and mm. definitely the first to market that even knew what Instagram was. Like we were the, the cool matcher brand at a time when it was booming as a search term and as a product and Victoria's Secret Angels wanted it and we were just the only one that was actually selling it easily online. And then we went into this landscape where there were like 20 to 50 competitors in mm. the course of like six months. Everyone just figured out that the barriers to entry were low and just went boom. Um, and that was super distracting. Like I reckon for a year I spent time just heavily researching everything they would do if they yeah. bring out another flavour or like whatever direction they were going in. I was like, oh, shit, and I'd go down – a trail of like wasting three or four months trying to, you know, formulate something they were doing before, you know, they'd pull it off the shelves because it wasn't selling and I'd wasted all this time mm. on comparison. And I think losing traction in that first six months of having competitors compared to when it was I was just focused on what we were doing 
And a couple of instances like that where I was about to take someone's lead and then heard that it wasn't a good idea or it didn't work for them and being like, God, if I had done that, Mm. it would have totally, you know, I felt like it wasn't a good idea but I just did it because everyone was. I think that really taught me early that you just have to keep your blinkers on because someone else is always looking for exactly what you have and so the way you do it differently is why people come to you and why people go to the competitors. But if you don't stick to what you've got, then you're just becoming exactly what they are. Mm. Um, So stick to your guns. Also, you have to do what's got more longevity rather than if you, you know, a lot of them were doing things that would get people really quickly because they wanted to kind of steal market share, but then weren't doing wholesale. They'd only do online. So Mm. it's like, well, what if the online retail context kind of slows down or, Mm. which it did. And Instagram's like, you know, like direct sales would slow down two years later significantly. And we'd spent all that time building wholesale. So I think that first three to four years really taught me how many mistakes I almost made by being too distracted by others um, and reminded me that, the you know, the grass is greener where you water it. And literally mm. on Instagram, if you're on your competitor's page, you're like giving them engagement. Mm. And I just realised like I can't follow what they're doing. So I yeah. think I unfollowed or did just blocked, blocked them until I could be sure that I wouldn't be tempted to do it. And that has meant that now that experience has made me very clear on, you know, we we're talking about mm. before, like how do, you, do I get anxious when I'm not on my phone and how am I comfortable with the, you know, am I still getting joy from the platform? And I think I am now because of those experiences. It's taught me very much to just delete and block the people that don't make you feel good when you're on it and only follow the people that, that you get something out of. And I feel really confident that the stuff I put out there is stuff that I like represents what I want to be doing and achieving for other people. Mm. So it makes it a really nice place to be rather than somewhere that's like pulling my eyes towards like people with better bodies or people whose businesses are doing better. Or, and it's all just like fluff. Yeah. Like, and you realize that when you realize that what we're doing is fluff. So what they're doing must be fluff. <laughs> mm. And we did an incubator with Chibani, which was amazing. But again, like what you think a business is, what, what everything looks like on the outside is never what the operations are like. So there's no point getting all riled up about something when it's all just perception and smoke and mirrors and the ones that are doing so well don't have a big following and don't market very well and the ones that aren't doing that mm. well look like that, you know. So it's just like just focus on what you're – all you can control is what you're doing and any time that you spend stressing on everything else is just a waste of your energy and you've got so little energy and time as it is, like that's not what you want to spend it on. What do you think about uh, the having an internal list of all the things that you want to be doing and when – is there ever a point where you're saying, okay, I need to be the first to market with with this? Like I guess on that sort of competitor talk, I know that the daily talk show, we've got a list of stuff that we want to get done and oh, it yeah, feels yeah. like there's a opportunity to be first to market with those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's your vibe on giving something time versus trying to be the first to, to market? Yeah, that's a really hard one. I think in food it's a lot harder because you can't just go willy-nilly with things because if there's a mistake, like it's a serious legal issue if there's like public liability mm-hmm. or something like that. So we're a bit more careful um, before releasing anything because you have to get so many food approvals and registrations. But I still think being first to market particularly now is still so important because it's so rare. Mm -hmm. It's such Mm -hmm. a head start. It really is such a head start to not have competitors and to be, it's hard enough to start a new business, let alone when you're Mm -hmm. already competing against big players in the market who out resource you. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I think, I think it's so, that's the whole done is better than perfect thing comes from that. It's like you get, especially if no one else has done it before, just start and figure it out. But then if it's an app or something that if you, you don't want to sabotage yourself either. If you Mm. release it before it's ready and then you, you've got one chance to make your audience sure that it's going to be good, Mm. you kind of have to get in the middle of that, (laughs) somewhere in the the, middle of that. I guess there's the financial investment as well. Yeah. It's like working out the right time. Like even I think with our studio space is it's like, the reality is we could have kept doing the show without the space, without the equipment that we're using. And so it's, you know, it's but working could out. We? The, well, I mean, that's the question. Would it, mm. And so when things are working mm. and you're getting, you know, you're seeing some f- f- uh, form of success metric on the incline, yeah. it's like the story could be, oh, no, everything we're do- we've done is is why, why that's that going happened. up. Totally. But it's hard to know because like when people walk into our studio, they're always like blown away and they're and excited about it. If we had rocked up differently and it was a different scenario, would we be giving off the same brand mm. and all that sort of thing? So it's, yeah, it's interesting. So when do you call 
bullshit on your own story? Ooh. That's a good question. Because I think we could call bullshit on, yeah. on the story we've told ourselves, yeah. but we got this offer, so yeah. we're happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The I lease think... is two years. <laughs> <laughs> Option of three. Yeah, yeah. I think that's kind of part of your everyday journey. Like mm. there's a moment in every day where I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Like <laughs> yeah. I have no idea. And part of that imposter syndrome and that feeling of fraud is I think – uh, you know, I try when I talk about self doubt all the time as like the thing that's the most natural human reaction to stepping out of your comfort zone. And so, if you're ever going to be a person who's learning and evolving, you're going to come across that feeling. And instead of seeing it as a bad thing, I think it's something that shows you that it's proof that what you're doing is actually worthy. It's going to mm. teach you something and teach you something new. So that imposter syndrome just shows that you. If I didn't have that, I think I, I was either too comfortable because I was too sure of what I was doing or I think that I wasn't checking myself enough to ever learn or evolve. Mm. So I think it happens every day. Every day I kind of check myself and I'm like, oh, my God, I don't know. I have no background. Like something will happen in Matcha and even though it's been around for five years, I'm like it could be double the size or it could be triple the size or I could have had, you know, 25 SKUs or, you know, you hear these things in the news that um, a tea company got acquired for like, two billion or whatever it is and you're like oh maybe I could have done that by now and mm. or why haven't I is it because I don't know anything I don't have any experience and should I get investors and like you're always triple questioning your decisions because they're yours and no mm. one else has helped you make them and you're like am I wrong like and that's I think that's just part of it are you hard on yourself very mm. um I think I that's part of what keeps me driven is being hard on myself I think the past year, and this is actually something I was going to say to you before, is that when you're making that decision, bef you know, about do I do the next thing or do I start something new, over the last year what's become more important to me is what is that going to mean day to day? Because I think we chase how something sounds in the abstract and don't think about day to day, is that going to be shit? Am mm -hmm. I going to hate every day even though I like the sound of how that sounds or am I going to enjoy it? It's like being an author. If you don't like sitting down and writing a fucking <laughs> yeah. book, don't become an author. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. Like because it sounds great to be a published author and yeah. have your own book, I think a lot of people would go, yeah, sure, like I have to write a book because uh -huh. everyone has a book. Mm -hmm. Oprah has a book. Like yeah. I can't be Oprah unless I have a book. But if you hate writing, yeah. you're going to you're committing to spending mm. a year unhappy. And it's sort of like, is that really a good trade? Yeah. I mean, how much do you care about the book thing? So I think I, w I am very hard on myself, but this year because it's the wedding year, you know, I think I made a really big decision at the start of the year to be a little bit less hard on myself and just let myself be part of the 11 a.m. club some days. Like, yeah. Because it's <laughs> yeah, sounding real good. You've, because you've the yay. Yeah, yeah. What do I buy? Where do I buy? <laughs> the, well, it? the big thing was this is part of the checking yourself thing is that if I am preaching finding a joy and I don't make time for it myself, then I'm a, I am a fraud. Like that is so hypocritical to mm. be like, well, I'm, you know, become so consumed in this podcast that I work in matcha and then I come home and do the podcast and then I have no time to read crime books yeah. or find joy and I'm like, you know, we're on my laptop all the time, then I'm not seizing my yay even though I'm telling you to do that, mm. which I is, you know. I think so, um, some of the, I mean, in Gary V, you had Gary V on your podcast. I think I've heard him before talk around, you know, you've got your thing that you want to make your full-time thing, so your side hustle and you need to keep your job like what you did, worked mm. in the law firm but started on the side. For someone, and I know you've probably you probably felt like this. You just want to get out. You don't mm. like that advice. Yeah. It's not you know because you want to annoying. You want to just yeah, hand like, in your resume. Don't tell me that you <laughs> asshole. <laughs> Do you think there's a time? When is that time? And yeah. from your lesson, what is that moment? Because I don't think it's just a dollar value yeah. of how much no. pro how much money is coming in the door. Especially for those, the, there are some products or business structures where. By its nature, you will never make enough. You will never get it to the point that where mm. you need to jump unless you jump. So yes. you're just going to keep chasing that if you wait too long. I think the moment for me was when they become mutually exclusive. And I think people forget as well that when you start a business like a, as a side hustle, you're not inundated straight away. Like it takes you a while to grow to the point where you would even have enough to do full time. I think people think it happens straight away and then you suddenly look with this decision of like, oh, my God, do I leave my job? But it, it happens slowly because you have to build to the point where you have enough to do every day. And I definitely didn't. I had more than enough time to still do my law job for the first six mm. months. It wasn't until the minute where I realised I would have to say no to opportunities in the business because I physically had no more hours left. When you get to that like real 
kind of grindy point where it just everything's pushing and there's no more room for you to move, that's where it becomes necessary to either choose one or choose the other. And that's when it's not as scary anymore because you realise it is a once in a lifetime opportunity. When you've still got your foot in kind of both and mm. you can still kind of manage them together, I'm like, keep, keep doing that because mm. the cash flow will help you enormously. Mm. Your wage will probably help the business grow for the first, you know, however long it is. I think it's just when you are becoming your own opportunity cost in the equation, that's when you can consider leaving. Like, mm. are you stopping it from ever getting bigger? If you've hit the maximum that you're ever going to get to without leaving, then it's maybe time to give it a chance because you can always go back. Mm. We've Especially, been, we've been talking a lot about um, perfect days, and uh, Tommy and I have gone into detail about our perfect day. Ooh, what can would you please share? Oh, no, uh, you they don't go want too to. long. <laughs> <laughs> to, like, full episode, but we want like seriously, like fifteen minutes on perfect day. If you were to go into extreme detail about your perfect day, mm-hmm. waking up, what time? We know, 11. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty short day, to be honest. <laughs> what time did you go to bed if it's 11? Yeah, it's oh, like, that's when I've gone into a vortex yeah. of YouTube and I'm yeah. watching dogs coming home to their owners from <laughs> Afghanistan. Like, yeah. it's a really great time. There's also pregnancy announcements when there's twins. It's oh, the yeah. best. Oh, really? I, I go, yeah, when there's twins and, like, they don't tell anyone that two have come out yeah, and then you uh, can walk into the hospital. See, this is the shit that I end up yeah. doing in the middle of the night. Um, and, like, uh, they're holding one baby and then the dad pops out with the other and it's the yeah, best. The, um, the gender, best. gender reveals gone wrong is another oh, great yeah, one. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, really good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just, I can't, I can't go past a, an owner coming back from Afghanistan to the dog. Yeah. It's just my my yeah. Yeah, my real trigger point. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the perfect day, what would you, if you were to go into details, okay. seriously, yeah. like be okay. outrageous with how long it goes for. I want okay. like every, blow by every blow. yeah, blow by blow. Okay. Um, well, they'd be asleep in. Mm-hmm. I'm a big sleeper in error, not a morning person. I force myself to be a morning person most of the time. Um, and the first thing I always do is What go time for, are you waking up? Uh, probably like a 7, 7.30 up. Does the alarm go off? The alarm definitely goes I don't okay. wake up naturally. Okay. I, I, this otherwise is it's 11 a.m. Well? Like, oh, no, th- that's an, a normal day. So okay. on my perfect day I would sleep naturally until I woke up, Yeah, which is not on a weekend, probably like 9, okay. like 9.30. Mm-hmm. Uh, I go for brekkie. I love brekkie dates. I go out for brekkie every single day. Like I don't buy handbags. I don't buy jewellery. I'm not like a things girl. I'm Mm -hmm. an experiences girl and like food. Poached eggs girl. Mm. I'm a poached egg smash dabo girl. I'm so (laughs) Melvin. It's like ridiculous. Um, So I go out for brekkie. Um, Gosh, I don't know. I think, I don't know if I'd work on, I think I would work. I think I'd have like a podcast episode to sit down and edit. Mm -hmm. I like feeling like I'm, you know, producing something or you know, I, I Where think, are you in the world? Oh, I love traveling more than anything, mm-hmm. but extreme travel, like our um, honeymoons in Egypt. Amazing. Like we do weird stuff. I'd uh-huh. probably be in Africa or like, you oh, know, right. on the beach in, I don't know, like Seychelles or you been the Caribbean to Poland? or something. Haven't been to Poland. I'm just worried that you won't be able to get smashed ever at these places. Well, I mean, that's tough. Well, I'm thinking <laughs> it'd be tough. Um, <laughs> Mexico, yeah, maybe. Me- yeah, Mexico. Maybe at least guac. I'm really – I'm a summer baby, so yeah. I'd be somewhere warm, yeah. somewhere where there's a beach but where there's also cafes that have smashed avocado. Okay. <laughs> Potentially yeah. California. Poten- L- Los oh. An- or no, not oh. much of a Los Angeles I, I mean, it's, okay. it's It's a great holiday. I've never said gal before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, wow, that's- <laughs> and we don't edit. <laughs> oh, sorry, you're fucked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm, I'm maybe somewhere more exotic. I think probably okay. like a south of France. Okay. Or, or in like, like Nice? South, like, yeah, mm-hmm. or like a south mm-hmm. of Italy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And so you're. Um, so I'd be on my computer doing mm-hmm. some learning things for my brain. Um, the golden retriever would be there. Mm. Nick would be there. Um, it's about ten grand in customs yeah. costs, like in oh uh, getting the, the dog across. But and then six months day. in quarantine to go home. It's full really? on, isn't it? It's so full on. No, why that Johnny Depp? Just get a jet and take <laughs> it on the plane do a like Johnny Depp style. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember what happened? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm. They actually have to live in quarantine for six months. That's horrible. I hope it's nice. It's well, we not had, nice. We it's had, not nice. Remember, it's jail. We, it's jail. It's doggy dog, jail. Dog, dog jail. We had Marley on and her mum worked at an airline and said that uh, never take your dog on yeah, the plane. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so go on. Yeah, so, so he would somehow have shipped himself over on a nice golden retriever friendly boat. Um. And there'd be a dip in the ocean, probably a run or like some kind of class. Uh, and then I would read a true crime book for the rest of the afternoon okay. in the sun. Do you speak French or Italian? Both. Fuck, that's yeah, good, isn't it? I speak it? a lot of languages. That's I love so, languages. Fluent? 
Oh, I'm fluent in French. I did all my law exams in French. Wow. Um, I know. It was stupid. I cried law for like exam, three months. Law exams in <laughs> French? It was so like, stupid. Because law isn't hard enough. I know. So do it in a different language. That, that is dyslexic. outrageous. It was dumb. It, in my brain, it was, you know how I force myself to into situations that are going to be beneficial like at mm. the end? I didn't think about, this was when I hadn't learned the whole day-to-day, what does the decision oh. mean? You know, overall I was mm. like, well, I'll be fluent at the end. So that's awesome. And then I hated every minute. I was like, I'm going to Europe on exchange and I'm going to be, you know, at partying and on boats and stuff. And I was just studying the whole time. So does that mean would there (laughs) be... so lame. (laughs) So lame. (laughs) Would there be things in the legal system that you only know the French word for? Um, Probably not. Okay. There's there's a few things in civil law, which Mm -hmm. is like the system that applies in Europe, that we have common law in Australia. So Mm -hmm. there were some things that I was like, oh, my God, that doesn't exist. It is je ne sais quoi. Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Mate, I'm the guy that asked for French onion soup in France. <laughs> they said, what? Onion we just soup. call it onion, onion soup. Exactly. <laughs> and, and so you've had the Nick's dip. Singaporean yeah. and when he orders Singaporean noodles, he's not Singaporean, like he's grown up in Australia. Yeah. He's from Tassie. And he goes, I'll just have the noodles. And they're like, which ones? He's like, well, I'm Singaporean, so I just call them noodles. I'm like, it's not funny. <laughs> it's a dad joke walking. It's like you turned 30 it. and he went, Dad jokes, like it's just yeah. gonna be my thing now. Tommy's all about that. They, you don't even know how you can do them. <laughs> it's a, it's a <laughs> they just come out. It's a real <laughs> skill. I mean, you can do your, your exams French. in French. <laughs> I can do dad jokes. It's all good. Dad jokes in French. And so, uh, so you've done the the um, class, or you've gone in the water. Yeah, gone in the water. Um, some. What's kind the of, temperature outside? Ah, oh, I reckon like a good thirty-two. Mm-hmm. That's hot. A thirty-two, but not a thirty-five. Like a thirty-one, thirty-two. Is it Euro thirty-two? Yeah, uh, so a warm Mediterranean water 32. Yum. That'd be nice. You say yum? Yum. Yeah. (laughs) Yummy. She's not drinking it. Gal. Gal, yum. (laughs) It's a daily talk show. So this is what happens. (laughs) I've just spread the yay to you guys. (laughs) This is great. And we're not even past uh, your exercise. So you've done. Yeah, so I've done some some exercise. The dogs Mm -hmm. had a swim. And then I find like a cliff or something Mm -hmm. where I can like spread out and just read a crime book for the rest of the afternoon. Um, and then eat again, big eater, mm. some kind of big Mediterranean feast. Yum. And then, yum. See, that's the right context. <laughs> yum. Yum. <laughs> I got it right there, guys. And then, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, just a nice quiet evening walking around. Well, we fucked Gelati. up because we didn't mention our partners at all. And no, you've but done you, the same your business thing. partners, so your partners and business partners. Yeah, so. but you haven't mentioned at all Nick in throughout the whole perfect day. The dog you? got to mention. The dog got to mention. No, and I said Nick. I said the dog and Nick, and that's because I've traditionally <laughs> not said that. And then Nick's been like, "Wow, you." Yeah. I don't bitch. think you did say Nick. Did you say? <laughs> Nick? Oh, maybe I thought. Oh, no, I we did. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we got. You were thinking out him because I was yeah. thinking yeah. my Tommy, wife, but I didn't Tommy, say. Tommy literally <laughs> in the other day, Tommy had a moment where he said. Oh, and then I go on a flight to LA. And I was like, oh, with Bodhi, like his son is like, oh, no. <laughs> Work trip. So, I mean, Work it's, trip. it's interesting. It's interesting about the perfect day because then you, it starts to reframe your normal day. And you're like, oh, why don't I? Do all those mo- things. Yeah. Well, you're nailing the breakfast. I kind of do all those yeah. things. Yeah. <laughs> Just you're I in Melbourne, it's freezing. There'd be a massage. Mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of massages. There'd be a massage in there. Um, and then some Netflix. Some crime related. Mm, I'm mm. such. This is so weird. Okay, so I'm such a happy, optimistic, like the kindness of humanity, blah 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 kind of person. Mm-hmm. And then my joy when I have everything stripped back is like war yeah. and crime and genocide. Like it's like, what the <laughs> fuck is mm. wrong with me? Why does that make me happy and relaxed? Well, I think well, like a- a- Archipelago. Have you read that? No, oh, it's a- fucked up. I'll love it then. Part of history. <laughs> anyway, well, yeah. no, there's something it- interesting about like the the like uh, the world and all the shit that's going on. Like I went and did a big deep dive into North Korea like two years ago, just reading all it's of my the... my people. And it's it's insane. Yeah. Like the, I was reading, um, oh, there's one, it's like a love story or whatever, but oh it's like God. fascinating. Do you know, so I was born in South Korea mm-hmm. and people are always like, which Korea? I'm like, well, yeah. obviously the one that you yeah. can leave from. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 Well, yeah, it's because like, I think like there's only been a few defectors unless you're running through the uh, what was it DMZ or yeah, like which Daniel I can't trial. go to. Oh, because in have case you got I a get part- snatched? It is full on, isn't wow. it? Mm. But you think about like like just stopping for a moment and thinking about all the people that are in the world, mm. and then think about like what they're doing. 
It's pretty crazy. Yes. I did it once. Like I was flying what over. I was, yeah. no, I was flying dot, dot, over. Dot. I was, no, I was flying over Adelaide, like just in a plane. I remember yeah. once. Yeah. And for some reason, I fucking got chills. I'm like, look how many people are in Adelaide. <laughs> I was flying from um, Israel to Italy, Israel. and we're going over these look like desert areas and these rocky mm. areas, and there's little lights on, and that's when I go, holy shit! Look how chills. look at where people live. Mm. This is crazy. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I dot, think dot, th- dot. This is the stuff. <laughs> this is the stuff that keeps me up at night, and I think that's why war fascinates me so much. Is because it's the psychology, like the human condition. It's mm. like how how did people like us degenerate to that state of affairs? Well, how fucked would we be if we had to fight in war? That's the other thing I think about. Like if if yeah. all if things happened and all of a sudden we had to like sort shit out, we're hopeless. Yeah, what would we do? So this is why mm. I didn't go to Korea for fifteen years because mm. I have a birth certificate, not a passport. But there's a technicality where I could be called out for military service. Not oh. now because I'm mm-hmm. 30, but I yeah. could have been. And I was like, I don't feel like I'm equipped for that. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, it's just, not. I mean, I just I'm want some yay, but... not this bloody <laughs> yeah, gunfight. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just not my vibe. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> so have you been to South Korea then? Or? I went back mm-hmm. with Nike actually three weeks ago, and it was the first time in 17 years. Was and it I was a, so nervous. Or what was the experience? Uh, not really, because I left there when I was six months old Mm -hmm. and everyone's like, oh, but, you know, do you remember like remember being torn away? And I'm like, do you remember when you were six months old? Like I'm a full-blown white Australian country bumpkin in my brain. Yeah, I only remember here. So it was like it was Mm -hmm. it was nice to be Mm -hmm. like, wow, this city has changed so much in 17 years. But also it was kind of like any tourist who's Australian going there and being like, cool. Yeah. Mm. Do you feel a connection? Not really. I mean, especially because – even the locals know that we're Western because our body language and everything, and we're speaking English, obviously. They don't go, oh, come up to me and talk as if I'm from yeah. there. They're like, oh. Like they speak English to me straight yeah. away. So I'm like, They're I don't you. feel like, yeah, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a dormant spy. I think it's my fashion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably because I was looking for the smashed avocado and they were like, <laughs> yeah. we don't do that here. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming on the podcast. It's great just uh, talking shit with a fellow podcaster. Oh, and it's fun. Um, yeah. It's nice to I, – I like you in like the – you know, obviously you, you do normally doing interviews and stuff, so it's nice just to fucking talk, to talk absolute shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's my favourite kind of talk. Yeah. Well, would you ever consider doing something that's like a an added on thing to – uh, what you do that is a little bit more chatty? like that. Well, not chatty, but just, yeah, loose where you can be really yeah. outrageous. Yeah. So every now and then I did it for my 30th. Mm-hmm. I do one where I just talk, like people yeah, ask right. questions and then I just kind of like let it all come, let it all hang out. Yeah. And it's a great time for all. And I think people are like, whoa, <laughs> she's fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> That's good though. I appreciate uh, it. That's yeah, good, yeah. Nick and I are going to do one for our wedding where uh-huh. people can just go to town and we'll do like the newlyweds game and record it. Oh, that'd cool. be awesome. So it's less structured and it's more just, and I kind of, it depends on the guest as well. I feel like some guests, the episodes come out that way because mm-hmm. they're like hysterical yeah, yeah. and some of them come out a little bit more structured. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I've been thinking about more how I could do a more loose, unplanned segment that wasn't researched, maybe by bringing back guests who have already been on. It's so Good much idea. power in that. Cho- like, um, yeah. Choose your own adventure as well would be yeah. something oh. fun you could play, like a, a cards or, you know. What is the ca- Is that a card Yay game? cards. Oh, but yeah. just to choose your oh, own adventure so you pick it. So be like, because yeah. you are so great at, at talking, well, you, you know. The quote, book, the quote calendar, was it? Or what was it? Yeah, the, it's yeah. a little flip book. Yeah, I could imagine something around like. Choose a theme or something. Yeah, like mm. questions and stuff too. Like the milkshake ones. Like yeah, that, yeah, that was exactly. really fun. Yeah, I love that those mm. kind of chats and I'd love to be a bit looser and like just chatting about random mm-hmm. random stuff. And well, I, I think like I encourage every guest to be that way. If they get onto something, they're really interested in it. We just go with it. Well, it takes time too. Like I think the other thing is it's like we always end up drawing out the ends because it's like we're just like a bit relaxed. Well, we're exhausted by the end of the episode and so – we don't, we, we're out of podcast interview. Question. Mo- no. like mo- mo- <laughs> or just that mode. Yeah. And so I feel like that's where it's actually uh, some of the magic can be. Yeah, totally. You know? Yeah, great. Thanks for being on the show, Sarah. Oh, thank would you love so much ha- for having me. This is amazing. back on um, very for, soon. For more fat chewing. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Nice. It's a daily talk show. If you enjoyed the show, uh, screen grab, share it on Instagram. Also check out Seize the Yay on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, anywhere. 
podcasts are. Thanks, any, gals. any any episodes? <laughs> Thanks, gals. Thanks, gals. And you, said, you, said, you said gals the other day though too. I? I yeah, think that's but I was where, probably taking the piss. No, you won't. <laughs> you won't. You're definitely saying, "Oh, like do you gals?" Oh, you're saying it to shameless. Every time Did you I? say gals, I just my ears ring. <laughs> it's just like trauma. Uh, but but you said it, dude. Yeah, no, I did. But I was being a bit. But funny. they are gals. I'm yeah. a gal, so yeah. it's a bit weirder. To yeah. just kind of let out, let gal out of the box if for the it, day. If, if people have listened to one episode uh, of CZA Ooh. based on our audience and I was at work, a few gro- the Gronk Squad. The Gronk Squad. <laughs> oh, that's a hard. Okay, yeah. so. I think mm-hmm. my my favourite episode is the one with Barney Miller, who's the mm-hmm. paraplegic surfer. Oh, I haven't I haven't heard that one yet. Right, Him great. and his wife mm-hmm. are legends, mm-hmm. and he was very early. I reckon like episode seven, and is one of the happiest people I know. And he mm-hmm. was twenty in a car accident, no alcohol. He was the passenger driver. Got out pretty much with a scratch, and he was like complete C six quadriplegic. Wow! Right. And he learnt to walk again to no kneel again to propose. And walk again to have their first dance. And it's just like the most beautifully chilling, amazing story just about humanity. Like they're amazing. Amazing. Put and it in the show notes. Yeah, yeah they're so much fun. Oh, thank you. Uh, hi at thedailytalkshow.com is the email address if you want to send us an email. Otherwise, we'll see you tomorrow, guys. See you guys. Bye, gals. <laughs> <laughs>